What's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? You are listening to the Data is My Science podcast, the show that makes data your passion. I am your host, Dapper Data, and today we're going to hit the marketing side of things, right? How do you market to people, right? And before I bring the special guests on, you know, I like to bring the special guests, right? The experts in the field. But before I bring the special guests on, I want to talk a little bit about how important marketing is, right? You know, in my eyes, marketing is probably one of the most important things right, when it comes down to your business and getting your business out there so everybody can understand your business, your product, what you're selling, you know, how do you get uh, from that point A to point uh, Z? We're going to talk a little bit about that, right? And when you think about marketing, successful entrepreneurs use marketing research and data analysis to really keep up with the trends in their business, right? They want to make better decisions, so they use data, they use market research to do that, and they maintain their company's competitive edge when they're doing that. So it's all important, right? Marketing is important to you and you're going to find out how important it is. But we're not going to just talk about marketing. We're going to dive a little bit deeper and say digital marketing, okay? So we're, we're, uh, I'm, I'm sure that there's a difference, right? I believe it is and, and we'll be able to uh, find out how much there, the difference is, you know, once we talk to our expert in here. So I want to bring to you all Mary Kate Spires, all right? This, this person right here, I'm telling you, she is a genius, Okay, in her field for sure. All right, Mary Kay Spires is one of the leading experts on using data and research to improve marketing return on investment. Okay, if you want to know if you're putting in all this energy, right, are you getting any type of return for it? You're putting all this money, you're getting any type of return on that, right? I'm sure that you don't even understand the return that you're getting. And Mary Kay Spires is going to be able to help you out with that, right? We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to dive deep into how we do that return on investment in digital marketing. OK, so Mary Kay Spires has worked with dozens of prominent brands from all over the uh, United States, including Smartbug Media, HubSpot, the Arbor uh, Company to drive leads, return on investment, you name it. Uh, she has a degree in, with the University of South Carolina in public relations and has had over 10 years of digital marketing experience. So Mary Kay Spires, without further ado, I want to introduce you all to Mary Kay Spires. You know, thank you for being on the podcast. Uh, tell them a little bit about yourself. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me. Shoot, I don't even think I can um, add anything <laughs> else to that introduction. You're so. awesome. You're awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, like you said, I've been doing this for over 10 years now. Um, I'll add a human element to it. I'm here in Columbia, South Carolina, um, and I am a dog mom to a Morky named Harley and then two mm -hmm. Boykin Spaniels named Johnny and June. Ooh. So they keep me busy when I'm not doing <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, hey, that, that, that you, I'm sure you can find a way to do some type of digital marketing with, with the dogs if you needed to. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have been over 10 years in a digital marketing space, right? We think about how, COVID has really impacted, right? We talked about that a little earlier. COVID has really changed the game for a lot of people that understood that, right? So you almost have to be prepared for that digital marketing space. You think about a lot of these clothing companies, they have, you know, at one point you're selling in person a lot, right? You know, now it's like, all right, I can do everything online. And now you really have to uh, figure out how to sell more online, right? How to market your stuff online because people are like, I don't want to go in to this space with COVID, right? You know, what is digital marketing, right? How do you explain that, right? And then why is the return on investment so important to you? Yeah, yeah. So I always say digital marketing is pretty much anything on the internet. Um, <laughs> there, there's at one point I was in a procedure and um, on volume, I told my doctor that I was responsible for the things on the internet. Um, and mm -hmm. that's, is true, not all of the things, but a lot of things. Um, and so, you know, digital can take a lot of forms, but it all comes down to that mobile, web, any type of device that you're on. It's not as much in person um, mm. from Google to Facebook to the metaverse, anything you could possibly right. imagine <laughs> um, is, is digital. Um, and I am actually, unlike a lot of marketers, I hate spending money. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
a big thing for me is making sure that whatever we're doing for my clients, it's actually worthwhile. It's worth that time investment. It's worth that money investment, all of it. And mm -hmm. so that's where proving marketing ROI has become a really big deal for me. And with digital it is about hundred times easier to do than it is with about any other type of marketing because just about everything is trackable. So that's why I really love it. And I, there's the traceability of everything. You can track it all back to where it came from. Um, and then two, being able to pivot. I mean, COVID's a great example. You've got an ad running to invite somebody into your store and then COVID comes in and you have to pull that and replace it to online shopping. That takes... Mm -hmm. 10 to 15 minutes and isn't a huge investment situation. But if you have a billboard, you have to spend one to three weeks getting that updated. Yeah. Exactly. So I love, that's why I just love digital because you can, you can make quick changes. You can go to market and test things without them being perfect. And then you can track all of it. And it probably costs a lot more to do that billboard, right? You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't even get me started. I have a whole tyrant on billboards. I'm not a fan. <laughs> right, right. I mean, then to do like a digital ad, right, specific to your company. And it probably exactly. depends on, I think I remember seeing a YouTube video, well, on YouTube, like that one banner, when you first go to youtube.com, I remember seeing that, that, that banner, just to get the banner up there for that first uh, scene banner that's there, you know, it's like, a ridiculous amount of money right for that so that's almost like a billboard that probably goes up where you have to walk past every day but it's just easier to just hey i'm gonna put this up right but just exactly costs and you can add the targeting to it i mean you can spend just as amount uh, just about the same amount but get hyper targeted and get your message in front of people that you actually want it in front of instead of people who are just happen to be walking by right 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 and I, I mean, I've, I've been looking into return on investment, how important it is a lot. You know, it is that measuring something, right? Measuring that return on investment is is so important in my eyes, right? You know, people want measurement, right? It makes stuff a lot easier for you to be able to make decisions, you know, when you can measure what's there, right? And I remember seeing this, uh, this article when uh, looking up some things, you know, based off of our podcast. And it was saying that more than 70% of people now research a company before deciding to become a customer itself. So it's almost like, you know, investing in digital marketing is so important because there's strategy. It's actual, it's, it's actual strategies behind it to, to be or to not manipulate, if you want to call it, maybe manipulate the customer's mind when they're trying to you know, uh, uh, or having some type of strategy be behind fighting against some of those customers that are doing their own research these days, right? Do you see a lot of customers doing their own research and stuff as well? Oh my gosh, it's one of my big pillars is to do research. Um, yeah. <laughs> you can't build the house without a solid foundation. And so that mm -hmm. research is so important. And, you know, any type of industry where your customer has to do a lot of research, like you were saying, you know, they, they look up a lot of things before making a purchase. It's mm -hmm. super important to get that info, get their answers, their questions answered mm -hmm. ahead of time. So if they're just starting to look for something that you can help them with offering them content and answers ahead wow. of the game, you're going to beat out the competition. And so yeah. there's research from a lot of point, points of view. Yeah, yeah, no, that's interesting. You know, I I never thought about combining that uh, the the actual research that you do on your own. Like, you still have to have that manual research. It seems like outside of the uh, automated data analytics standpoint, you know. And if somebody was ask you, uh, would the robot ever take over the machine? Ever take over your job? It's probably I don't think it would ever happen because uh, you have you have to do some type of manual research. You have to vet the research that maybe the robot has even done, you know? Yeah. So you have to have that human aspect there, you know? For so, sure. You know, so, so I want to get to one of the, I, and this is, to me, this is a hot topic, right? You know, understanding your audience within marketing, digital marketing, right? Yep. Understanding that specific customer, right? And it's funny because as I began my business in Dapper Data, I was thinking, oh yeah, I can just, give my services to the world right everybody can have it i don't care i'm gonna that's not and and i'm not even thinking about oh how can i scale that way or i'm not even i'm and i i thought that my by me 
refining or by me getting very granular with my specific customer, then I'm losing clients, right? I'm getting, I'm, I'm going to lose them because uh, now I, I specifically say I'm, I wanted a male versus female or a female versus male, right? Or I wanted a person between the age range of 25 and 30. And then, oh my goodness, what about people who want their service outside of that, right? How, how to better, excuse me, how do you better understand your customer in the digital marketing space, right? That avatar. Yeah, um, this is a little loaded. And I think that this, <laughs> <Not bad. laughs> um, I think that, that, that this research goes beyond digital. I think it's important for any type of marketing. Um, but I really love to do buyer research in two ways that kind of layer on top of each other. So one mm -hmm. is that buyer profile, which is really what you were talking about with the avatar, you know, age, mm -hmm. demographics. Um, you mm -hmm. can find that by looking in your database, the information you already have on your customers. You can do surveys um, to get that information relatively easily. But I think what makes a really big difference in a strategy standpoint is to look at something um, a lot of people call buyer personas. And these are fictional representations of your ideal buyer, but mm. it digs deeper into what their challenges are, what their goals are, and what their motivating factors are. So this is where you can see okay, this person typically spends a lot of time on LinkedIn, so I should be doing marketing on LinkedIn or anything like that. And how I, the best way, in my opinion, to go about that research is if you can, is actually interview potent, um, past customers, current customers, mm -hmm. um, lost customers, if someone went through your sales pipeline, but chose someone else, being able to talk to them, but really understanding their motivation and what they went through while they were looking for your service, that's going to give you more information than you could possibly imagine. And that, I mean, from there, I would say that you get to the point where your strategy almost starts to write itself because of all of the information you've gotten from customers. Yeah. Is that, is that, is that something that you see that takes majority of the time? It takes a lot of time um, and it's tough, right? Because you, when you start a business or you're revamping your marketing, you want to go to market. Like we're, mm -hmm. we're not wasting time here. But right. <laughs> I think that, you know, spending that four to six weeks in the beginning of doing a lot of research is going to set mm -hmm. you up so much more for success that it's going to be better than just guessing and going with your gut right out of the gate because you're going to end up seeing that it might not be working and you have to make adjustments. And so if you had just, you can still start sm small, right? Like you can, you know, your buyer profiles, so we can start doing a little bit of stuff. And then as we get more information from our buyer personas, we can layer that on top of it. So I'm not saying you have to sit in radio silence for six weeks while you interview people, but I think it's a, it's a big missed opportunity for a lot of businesses where they're just, we think this is what our customer wants instead of going and asking them. Yeah, I know. And, and do you see that it, that you have to revisit that over time? Yes, you know, yes. I mean, you're, you're, getting, you're getting so many questions out of me. I, you're just bringing up all these ideas. I'm thinking, man, you know, uh, I, I might need to, I, I definitely probably need to talk about, you know, how to, how to yeah. get my, my business out there a lot better, you know. But, so a yeah. lot of people say, a lot of people say you're supposed to update them every year, but that's exhausting mm. to me. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, from a reality standpoint, it's not really, that's not the easiest thing to do. So mm. I try to say every, about every three years, you should be revisiting okay. it. Um, or if something happens, right. If you're changing your value prop, or a pandemic hits, you should probably redo your buyer personas, you know, something that's like, oh, how everyone's thinking has changed, then it's time to redo them. Um, but I, the nice thing is, is when you do brush them up, you don't have to interview as many people, you can just do a couple and make sure you're still on the right track instead of kind of starting fresh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I think that's probably the biggest thing, gathering the people to interview. I, that for me, I haven't, I mean, that's something I didn't even think about, you know, actually getting that. I mean, I'm doing my PhD right now in data science and I know I have to interview people, but I didn't think about, well, when you're starting a business and you're trying to develop that avatar, right? Then, then interviewing people in that space to really further define, you know, certain things, you know, where 
you want that specific audience at, you know, do you believe that you're getting, when it comes down to it, having a niche audience or a niche avatar is very important in, in, in the space? Yeah, so I do. Um, I think that you're going to find a lot of different niches. So um, mm -hmm. while you're interviewing people, you'll kind of see what buckets they fit into. And that's how you know how to talk to those people. So you might say that a business owner is going to have a lot different motivating factors than a director of marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, you might notice something completely different is what separates them all. But that's where that like taking back and not listening to your gut on it, but actually doing the research mm -hmm. goes a really long way. Cause that's how you're going to find what resonates with people. And you might find out that you only have one buyer persona. They just mm -hmm. all have the same motivating factors and that's great. You just saved yourself a ton of content. Um, right. Or you might find that you have five plus mm -hmm. four buyer profiles and, you know, they all mix and match and it's complicated. Um, but you're really not going to like know that for sure until you're talking to people. Yeah, no, I, and I always believe that data is your biggest support mechanism, right? Yes. That's going to support the decision that you're making. If you're trying to go off your gut, right, you know, you can do, go for it if you want to. But, you know, that may take forever, right? Yeah. You know, we talked about how people just willy nilly put ads out and they're just like, let me, is this going to stick? Is this going to get the most clients? Is this going to take the client to the cart and buy and all this stuff? And they're never using data to help make the decision. They're just constantly just trying it, trying it, trial and error. Right. And I mean, I'm pretty sure they spent millions and millions yeah. of dollars, right. in these huge businesses just trial and error without having somebody like yourself to be able to help understand the data, to be able to make those decisions, you know, yep. Um, so I want, I, I, I didn't want to do this, Mary Kay. Okay. But I, but I, I'm going to have to give the audience your formula for the return on investment, uh -huh. right? <laughs> yes. I don't know, but I have to put you on the spot. Okay. Uh, yeah. so, so I know that I, I, I was, I've been trying to do this research, right. Forever, uh, ever since I, I've been trying to look at, you know, how to stop wasting time. Right. How to stop wasting money and energy uh, when I'm making all these decisions that are like impacting my business. And, um, you know, we talk about return on investment being the most important thing. But 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 diving deeper, you know, to to have a, a, a strategy or formula across the board. Right. When you go to every customer, you're like, look, this is my way of doing things right to get successful. Um, where do you have a specific formula that you follow? For return on investment? Yes. And I'll I'll start by saying that it's really important that your organization is all on the same page and understands the definition of what you're talking about very clearly. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, I really only pull what's called revenue ROI. And it's mm -hmm. that can also be called marketing ROI. And so what that does is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read it from my book so that I don't mm -hmm. mess it up because you know formulas. Um yeah. But, and it's simple. I keep it really simple. This can get complicated as heck, but mm -hmm. I just want to see that simple number. Um, and so you're really just taking your revenue mm -hmm. minus your cost and then divide it by your cost. And so mm -hmm. that's more, that's, that's revenue. Simple. Yeah, it's that simple. That's it. If, if that's just revenue ROI, if you're really looking for true ROI, you do need to do profit minus cost divided by cost. Um, mm -hmm. But depending on your organization or your relationship with the data that you're pulling, you might not always have access to profit, um, which is why revenue is a little bit easier to, to get a hold of. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's super simple. It's just using that same description across everything you're doing and making sure that who you're showing these numbers to understand what you actually pulled. Um, and then mm -hmm. I like to dig even deeper into that and look at um, source ROI. So mm -hmm. I pull, for example, Google ads, I will pull revenue brought in by from original source of Google ads, minus the cost of Google ads divided mm -hmm. by the cost of Google ads. And so now I understand what my MROI or RROI is for Google ads. And you have to be a little careful in doing that when it comes to digital, because mm -hmm. a lot of things work together. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's so many touches. People can 
be interacting with your content for years before they even become a lead. And so you really do have to take it with a grain of salt. But by looking at those original sources, it can help you identify issues um, Mm -hmm. if before they become large issues that's really impacting your bottom line. Man, so that's, that's definitely insightful. And I appreciate you breaking that down because I don't think anybody really looks at the the revenue, right, specifically, right? And at the restaurant even have in Ghana, when I look at marketing, I'm like, I don't think we look at the revenue, right? <laughs> you know, specifically <laughs> divide, the minus the cost divided by the cost, right? You know, yep. put out there. But the source ROI, I mean, that's something that is mind blowing to me because I didn't, I didn't even, I didn't even think about that part as well, you know. And I'm yeah. sure a lot of people don't think about. Well, yeah, especially because you know, oh, you you're running Facebook ads. Oh, yeah, we, you know, we're getting a lot of impressions on our Facebook ads. Okay, right. well, how many of those actually became leads, and how many of mm-hmm. those leads actually became customers? You know, mm-hmm. is that really the best use of our spend? And maybe it is, but maybe it's not. And we're not going to really know that without digging deeper into it. Right. And you probably have a specific number in your head uh, or on your sheet that says, hey, this is success. Right. You know, or do you leave it up to the customers to say, hey, what they deem is success? Yeah. I mean, that's that's tough because it really is always based on the client's goals and it's based on goals in general. I'm really big on setting goals around what we're trying to do. So maybe our goal is. Our, you know, our overall goal is always going to be to increase ROI, but how are we going to do that? So it's taken even a step back further and saying, okay, we're seeing that our Google ads aren't bringing in as much revenue as we would hope. Why? Mm-hmm. And so maybe our goal is going to be to increase the qualified leads coming in from Google ads and then worrying about turning them into customers. So it's really digging into that why you can just keep asking why until you're blue in the right. face. Um, right, right. And, I, and I'm a little, I'm a little against the status quo with goal setting um, because in my mind, success is anything better than yesterday. So as long oh, as we're like moving, like yeah. That. So as long as we're moving in the right direction, we're successful. Right. Um, right. Because ten dollars versus ten dollars of the day, that's still successful. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. And so it's because it's really hard, right? You see all these metrics online and you're supposed to have a 20% whatever and Mm -hmm. it's best practices. And a lot of people need those benchmarks, but I like benchmarking my own data and Mm -hmm. making sure my own data is getting better. And yes, it's, we always want to be better than competition and better than our peers or at least hitting the same thing, but let's know where we are. So we know where we want to go first. Right, right, right. So do you, do you help your clients out all the way through, right? From beginning to end, setting up the avatar, setting up that customer, uh, the, the person that you want to get to, right? But then also the return on investment and then continuing to like review some of those things to get it more defined. Uh, is that, do you, you take them through the entire process? Yep. Yep. Typically, um, you know, I usually, it's funny. I find all the problems. Um, mm-hmm. That's kind of my, my job, right? You know, Uh, For one client right now, Google Ads was a problem in 2020. That's fixed. Okay, next problem. Uh, Now it looks like organic search isn't bringing in as many leads as we'd like. So let's start digging into that. Um, And I am very much a generalist. I am never going to be able to speak to the uh, technical SEO or all of the Uh, really (laughs) deep understanding of all of that. But I know plenty to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, I help my clients find the right partners to be able to fix those errors. And, oh, great. Um, and yeah, and that, you know, it's just one thing at a time. I'm really big on only setting about one goal at a time. We're going to fix this and then we're going to move on to the next thing. And that's awesome because so many people are you. So you have people who specialize in specific areas right within that process. And you have people to say, look, I can guide you through the entire process. I know the right people. If I don't if I can't deep dive into it, I can kind of connect you right you know yep. and you need that you know because I, I i remember doing um social media analytics right for a customer right helping them out with their social media analytics so looking at social media looking at the analytics how can we dive deep into it you know to figure out what those things mean but then i realized well i'm not a 
a social media brand person, right? You know, so if I can, I can tell you that, all right, Tuesdays is your best day to post, right? And they say, and, and then videos versus, you know, uh, audio posts, right? Or text posts uh, or whatever, right? I can say, okay, you need to do more videos, right? Because that's your audience, that's what we're picking up. But then I could not tell them what type of videos to do, right? You know, and I could not connect them with, the right person, you know, so there's, there was a stop for me, right, or, and I said, well, hey, maybe I'm doing too much, because now they, they would say, well, that's what I want, I want to know what type of videos to post, I want to know what type of, and so then I said, all right, well, look, I just do auditing, right, I'm just going to audit it, give you the data, right, and here you go, run with it, but then you feel like you're leaving your client in limbo, right, you're like, man, I feel bad for you, because I, <laughs> I just gave you all the data, you're like, I don't even know what to do with this, right, I'm just going to leave it, I paid this money, and great, you know, so that's good that you provide that end to end, right? And even building connections to be able to help them out. You know? Yeah, yeah, so definitely. Important. So, um, so I wanted to highlight two important parts that I've seen in my eyes uh, when it comes down to marketing, right? Email and social media marketing, and using data to be able to do that. You know, how do you see yourself within your company being able to improve email marketing and social media marketing? Yeah, gosh. Um, so email marketing is huge because you already have all those leads. You don't, you, you know, you use the leads you've already paid for, try to convert them. Uh, it's much more effective. Um, and that, you know, data there, segmentation. The more segmented you can make your email list, the more it's going to speak to that person directly. So we talked about buyer personas. Do, let's say, I don't even know what, but we've got a doctor persona and a teacher persona. We don't want to send, send the same email to both of those people. We'd much rather send our doctor information that he's going to find interesting and our teacher information that he's going to find interesting. Mm -hmm. And so the more you can segment, you do all that with the data and the data you collect from people, that's how you can make your emails even more effective. You're going to see higher open rates, higher click-through rates, and hopefully mm -hmm. um, a higher customer conversion rate from it. Oh, my goodness. That's, that's sweet right there. I just... I'm not going to lie. I just took that information. I took all the notes from that. <laughs> <laughs> <We're done. laughs> you know, like, oh, man, that's a better way to convert, right? When you're breaking down the emails. You, I mean, imagine you have, uh, and it's weird. It's, it's weird that I'm a data scientist, right? I deal with clustering all the time and segmenting, segmenting, you know, specific uh, 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 data sets that I have, right, into like what I call like squares and stuff, right, to be able to predict you know, who's going to do what, right, or be able to even help me out with um, data anal uh, analysis. Uh, but I never thought about it from a digital marketing standpoint, and even your emails, right, being able to segment them into persona personas, you know, that would, that, that probably would make everything so much more efficient, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, you probably see that all the time where they don't do that, right? They don't say that's something so, you would think that's so basic, Right. But it just, you know, you're people forget. You don't think about it when you're, you're not, you know, you don't do that initial research. You're not going to to think about it that way. So it's really starting at the beginning. And, you know, when you're talking to that doctor persona, understanding what content he finds interesting and, you know, deep diving deeper into that, mm -hmm. because I mean, marketing, the more it's about the customer, the better it's going to be because mm -hmm. and and Google is really big on that. You know, people try to trick Google all the time, but Google is optimized for the customer. So if your customer has a good experience on your website, you're going mm -hmm. to rank higher in Google. So if you're really just thinking about how to help your end user, you're going to have good marketing. Oh, oh, so think about the customer first always when you're always. talking about marketing. Yeah. And so when you initially, I'm thinking, all right, you have, say you have a thousand emails, right? Initially, I'm going to just, am I going to blast them at first before I start uh, like breaking them down just to get a feel of who's opening what and things like that? And then so, I break it down. So it depends on the information you already have, right? If you already okay. have the segmentation, I would go ahead and segment them. But if okay. you don't, then you should blast one out. And it can honestly be an email that says, tell me more about yourself. And it has mm. some different little buttons and they click on a button. And if you have it set up right, that marks them as, you know, whatever you want to mark them as. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And then you, you segment them that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. This is too much free information right here. So so now if we talk about social media, right? Marketing. Yes. And it's it's very interesting because if you're now on social media these days, it's almost like you're a nobody, right? I hate to say it. I I I personally hate social media, and that's why I actually got into it more because I hated it, right? I hated yep. the fact that I was uh, sitting there as a business person, and that was a mandatory thing for most businesses. You must be on social media to drive your product or your solution or whatever it is that you're trying to get out there, right? Because everybody's always on social media. Right. And it's like, what matters, right? Uh, does it, is it the followers? You know, is it the, the saves? You know, I, I don't know, man. You know, there's just so many things, you know, that matters. And, you know, so do you tend to do the same thing? Are you segmenting, segmenting like the social media people like you did emails or how, how do you do that with social media marketing? Yeah. So social is a little bit more segmented by platform, right? So you're going to have a different voice on LinkedIn than you're going to have on Instagram. All, you know, your content should vary a little bit. Um, and then I think it really goes back to like setting those goals. And so people get really bogged down in followers and impressions, but what does that actually mean to your bottom line? And right. so if you're not tracking as much as you possibly can, if somebody clicked on something on Facebook and then went to your, your website, then what happened? Were they, qual right. were they qualified? Were they, oh, this isn't what I want. So there's a breakdown mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, you know, maybe it's the platform, maybe it's the messaging. There's a lot. I love social because, which is funny. I, I also do not like social, but from a <laughs> play, from a playground sort of place, I like social because there's so many different variables that mm -hmm. you can test. Um, and again, it's quick. You can, you can run a test for like three days on Facebook and mm -hmm. get so much data. Um, so it's definitely about setting those goals and then kind of playing with it until you figure mm -hmm. out what's going to work. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you were to bring somebody in to your company um, as a client, and you're sitting there, they're dealing with social media marketing. Would you say initially you'll monitor them for about thirty days or so before you say, "Look, now we can start figuring out what you know"? Do you want to know what they're already doing, or do you get clients that actually uh, don't know anything about what they're doing? They're like, "Look, just tell me what to do," right? Yeah. Or you get both. <laughs> All of the above. All of the above. Um, I mean ideally someone is tracking something um mm -hmm. that's i mean you can't do anything until you're tracking data mm -hmm. and so for me if there's no tracking set up then we're gonna we're gonna set the tracking up and let it run mm -hmm. um and then that gives us plenty of time to go do some research <laughs> while we wait um i like honestly three months worth of traffic um mm -hmm. or analytics and data so you can start to see trends. I mean, obviously you don't want to just sit there and wait three months if you're not tracking anything. So you can start making decisions, you know, around the one month mark. But I really mm -hmm. like that three month play. Um, digital builds on itself and it'll typically take about three months to really show you if it's going to um, be a big win. Um, you'll know pretty quickly if it's a fail, but uh, it, no. you need to give it time to learn um, on itself. So I really mm -hmm. like to give it three months. But of course, I would never sign a client, set up their tracking and then say, call me in in three months and we'll figure right. it out. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, so so definitely, definitely listen up, audience. If you want to, I mean, you know, if you could give three months before you jump in there with Mary Kate Spires, you know, you want to make sure you can do that, you know, so that she can have something to work with. You know, it's always better to work with something, right? You know, gotta start uh, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, you know, when you have a client that comes in and says, "Hey, look, I don't know what to do, where to start. I haven't even started posting anything on social media," you know, and 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 then you have to almost, uh, you know, give them a schedule, right? I think I work with a, a a group, a company that can actually provide a schedule to say, "Look, post this on this day, this on this day, videos versus text and all this stuff." For 30 days, right? You know, at a minimum, and then, and then I can collect something, right? You know, I mean, that's that's important, right? You know, so, uh, well, like I always, I always like to end with a dope gem, dope nugget, or something, right, to give the audience. And uh, what I, what I've seen here, right? I always talk about how data is a new oil, and they talk about it all the time, right? Data is king, okay. And so, when you sit there and you're making decisions, uh, no matter the business. Right. We talked about multiple people I brought on that that, you know, they don't even have to deal. They don't think that they deal with data on a regular basis, but they do. Right. To make the decision. 
And the reality is that data is becoming increasingly important to businesses and organizations, especially in the digital space. You know, how can you, I mean, I, if I was a company that uh, uh, was selling clothes um, in person majority of the time when COVID hit, I mean, you, you best believe I probably would transition everything over to digital space and never go back, you know, because it really does make everything easier, you know, and understanding how to use data to really improve marketing campaigns is key. And that's a, this is what Mary Kay Inspire is really showing you. OK. And so uh, is there anything that you want to leave the audience with, uh, uh, Mary? Oh, I think, you know, we were just talking about it, but oh my gosh, go set up tracking immediately. <laughs> you can't do anything until you have that tracking. Um, mm -hmm. That's my big, big key. And, you know, and then use that data to set your, set some goals and, yeah, and yeah. figure out where you can start making a change. And if they don't use, I guess, from a tracking standpoint, even on specific social media platforms, they can probably just check track those individually right you know yes. uh, yeah. you don't have to use a huge platform like the google analytics or something like that right i would try to do at least google analytics um mm -hmm. just so that you get that website back in data and you know mm -hmm. what pages people are visiting because the big thing is whatever platform you're on, whether it's social advertising, whatever, you wanna understand what's happening on that platform and then what happens on your website. So you need mm -hmm. something to be able to connect that. But you don't yeah. need to get fancy with Google Analytics. I am probably the least fancy person with Google Analytics, <laughs> um, but I know where my sources are coming from and I know what, what they do when they get to my website. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of tools out there now that make all of that a lot easier. Um, I'm a big fan of HubSpot, which uh -huh. will do all of it for you and pull everything yeah. in, um, makes yeah. it a lot easier to see. But I would, de you know, Google Analytics is free. I would definitely try to get something on your website. Um, and that's even, I mean, if you're using whatever platform you're using for your website, a lot of those have analytics now. So just anything where you can track where someone's coming from and then what they're doing on your website. Okay. Okay. So you heard it from the expert. Tracking is the most important thing to really get started. There are so many ways of different tra uh, to track your your websites. You know, track your social media traffic. You know, any of the traffic that you want to track. There's ways to do that. And so, um, you know, I definitely agree with you. You know, that's that's very important. You know, I mean, you you can't make any decisions if you're not tracking anything, right? You know, so or you can just off your gut. You know? It won't go well. It won't go well. It's going to cost you more money in the long run. Yeah. I promise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, um, so definitely use some of these tools out here to your advantage if you can. All right. So now we're going to have a little bit of fun. Okay. As the audience knows, I like to get into a game called overrated or underrated. Okay. And I got this from a motivational speaker that I like. His name is Gary V. And uh, a lot of times he's talking about, well, hey what is overrated, underrated, or, or, or is it right where it needs to be? All right. So they fire, they, they throw out a bunch of topics at him all the time. And he's like, oh, overrated, underrated, or right where it needs to be. And explain why if you want to. All right. So are you ready for it, Mary Kate Spires? I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. Okay. The first one is hard book, hardcover books. Ooh, that's a good question. I'm going to go mm -hmm. with underrated only because oh. there is something about holding a hard covered book that uh -huh. that just feels really good um mm -hmm. you know i i just put out a book and i just got my hands on the hardcover version of it mm -hmm. and there was something extra special about it being hardcover mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would say the same thing it was at one point i just you know i had all these hardcover books and I got I got tired of uh, having to kind of pull the hardcover book out and read it, you know. And I'm traveling a lot or something, you know. And then the audio the audio books, right? The audible books was just yep. it's like if you have the version of both, you know. I love the audible books. I just run right through those, right? I'm driving places, you know. I'm cleaning around the house, just listening to it and stuff, you know. But I do get if you could sit down, find some time, thirty minutes, an hour or something, get that hardcover book to kind of you know look at. You know, it is it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, relaxing, you know, yep. you will, relaxes the mind, you know, and it allows you to focus only on that one thing, you know, so I do like that. All right. Myrtle Beach. 
What a beach. Oh my gosh. So I'm going to say overrated, oh. but only because I, I actually go to a place called Cherry Grove, which is right north of Myrtle Beach. And uh -huh. it's this super quiet little place. And mm -hmm. it's the exact opposite of Myrtle Beach. And it's, <laughs> it's amazing because you're just yeah. there and it's quiet. And it's all these old people because they were uh -huh. tired there. It's amazing. So yeah. I am very much an old soul when it comes oh, to vacation. <laughs> well, a lot of things. But Would you call yourself an introvert? It's, I'm a very, very extroverted introvert. Oh, gotcha, yes. gotcha, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So I am, people always think I'm extroverted, but um, I get, I like the um, social interaction actions are very draining to me. So I have to be yeah. able to like go in and, and kind of reboot. Um, yeah, yeah. My I'm big thing, you. I love taking like daytime showers. Those are kind uh -huh. of like a reset for me. So yeah. Yeah, it forces you to kind of not do anything else, right? You got to yes. do the shower, that's <laughs> it. No, I agree. You know, I mean, being able to, uh, I would call myself, I used to just be a hardcore extrovert, right? But but I don't know if COVID did it to me or something, you know, uh, it is draining. As much as I love talking to people and always being around people, at the end of the day, I'm like, oh, just nobody, please. And I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to go off somewhere on a vacation where yeah. I'm not doing anything. I'm relaxing and you know, I always hear Myrtle Beach. I've been to Myrtle Beach a couple of times. I hate to drive. It's about eight hours for me oh. to get there, you know. But, um, you know, it's not it's not that big of a deal uh, anymore for me. I mean, everybody does it like once a year. But I didn't know. What, what's the name of the beach that you said? Uh, it's called Cherry Grove. It's, Cherry Grove. Okay. it's probably about 20 minutes north of Myrtle Beach. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a very check quiet that out. town. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Shrimp and grits. Uh -huh. Ugh. I actually don't like shrimp and grits at all. Oh, so I have to go with South it overrated. Carolina food. They said that's like one. Are you from South Carolina, really? I don't I'm know. From North, <laughs> so I'm, I'm really from North Carolina, but oh. my mom is from Washington State. And mm -hmm. so I actually grew up sans typical Southern yeah. comfort. Um, uh -huh. So I, I'm not into like collard greens or uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, shrimp and grits or really any of that. Um, uh -huh. Boiled peanuts, none of it. Oh, um, my, man, husband, it. <laughs> my husband, on the other hand, is all about all of it. So. Man, he, he likes the shrimp and grits? Oh, yes. Big fan. Um, at, least, at, least, at least he knows that whenever he orders it and you're out, you don't have to share it. He's <laughs> not going anywhere near it. Right, 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 right. <laughs> All right, social media. Uh, I have to, it's so hard from a personal standpoint, overrated. Yeah, I freaking yeah. can't stand it. I'm not even on TikTok. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm not into it. Um, from, a, from a business standpoint, you know, there's a lot of upsides there depending mm -hmm. on your industry and your goals. But yeah, yeah. yeah, I could do, I like them. I like to scroll Instagram for the memes. I find those mm -hmm. really funny. Um, but yeah. that's about it for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you on that. You know, if it, if it wasn't for business, I don't think I would be on social media as much. I mean, it's so time consuming to me, right? You know, yes. I'm sitting there. I I would start off right. I I could I could actually spend an hour or so on 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 social media if I if I didn't have anything else to do, right? With my kids and family and all that stuff. I mean, I, like sometimes I'll go in. I'm like, you know, you go from one page, you like a meme, and you're like, who wrote this meme? Then you go to all the memes that they're writing, and then you're like, oh gosh, you know, these are cool too. You know, then you're like, oh, okay, let me go over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so, uh beer oh underrated i love <laughs> beer oh my gosh uh, uh -huh. my husband and i are actually trying to go to um we're trying to drink 50 beers in every single state so 50 Ooh. beers in 50 states I didn't um, even get that when I read. <laughs> okay, that is awesome. Oh yeah, that is our big thing. We have we collect the brewery stickers and we put them on state cutouts. We're super into breweries and beer, and it's which is hilarious because when I got to college, I didn't even drink beer, um, oh. but now I'm a huge fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so is it fifty? Between y'all, or is it like fifty apiece, or fifty <laughs> apiece? But but flights count. Um, when you. we okay. first started, we said that flights did not count, and <laughs> it did not go well. You, it, you know, you gotta. <laughs> it did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided that flights counted. <laughs> definitely, definitely. All right, cheese. 
I love cheese. I feel like <laughs> I cheese is probably like right where it's supposed to be because like uh, everyone loves cheese. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. charcuterie boards have made like a huge thing now. Like, <laughs> but yes, I love cheese. My stepdad always jokes that I could live on cheese and bread alone. <laughs> it's, and I could. <laughs> we all know cheese comes with its problems too, right? We get, <laughs> but it's, sometimes it's, it's worth it. it. It's worth it, right? It's worth it. You know? So I get it. I get it. All right. This one might be a sore spot. Clemson Tigers football team. <laughs> Talk about overrated. Oh, my gosh. Is that on purpose? Because it's oh. Eastern North Carolina. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I mean, whatever. My brother and mom went there. He's a big fan. That's um, your rival, right? Oh, yes. I mean, my deep rival. And, mm -hmm. I, I mean, they were good. It was fine. But mm – -hmm. And they were so dramatic last season when they weren't amazing. I'm like, you guys need to calm down. And so, uh -huh. yeah, I'm not a fan. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you still go to some of the rival games every once in a while? Some. It gets a little crazy. So we like to watch it at home. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it gets intense. It's, yeah, we, the last time we beat Clemson was actually when I was in college. So oh. um, we're slowly getting better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're all the up, so. Yeah, you have a good football coach and all that stuff, so I like. Yeah, uh, so. we're real, real excited about him. So we, we have big, we have big hopes now. Yeah. All right. Having a schedule. Oh yeah, it's it's everything. Um, <laughs> underrated. I mean, if you can't keep a schedule, oh, I, I have a huge planner. I can like pull it up. I have like this huge planner oh, right here of on. everything. Yes, I have to be hyper organized or it all goes to heck. Yeah. Um, so yes, I'm big, big fan of schedule. I mean, things, life gets in the way, but mm -hmm. a little bit of planning goes a long way. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, I, I'm a, I, I, I try my best. You know, it's funny, everybody can create a schedule, but uh, sticking to it, I think being consistent with it has been the, you know, sometimes I get too intense with my schedule. Right. You know, sometimes I will say, all right, I have, you know, to be from point A to point B, but then I need to account for the drive time. I need to account for the, you know, all that stuff. Yes. And it gets overwhelming for me. Right. Yes. You know, and sometimes I'm like, do I, do I create a schedule for every month or do I go as big as every month or do I do it on a week by week basis? You know, um, yeah. ultimately, I just feel like a schedule is my strength. You know, it's definitely important. So I agree. All right. Okay, ice cream. I think it's right where it, it it should be. I'm not a huge ice cream fan. I love sweets. I love some dessert. Um, but ice cream, you know, I'll eat it, but it's never like a huge big thing for me. My husband's the exact opposite. If there's oh, ice yeah, cream I in the house, it's gone. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I am tearing up some ice cream. You know, I don't care how healthy or how, how much of a healthy kick, a health kick I'm on. You know, ice cream is my weakness. Yes. I will tell everybody that, you know. And the last thing, all right, sweet tea. Oh, see, again, it goes back to my southern, my non-southern southern roots. Um, mm -hmm. I don't like sweet tea. Oh. Um, so oh. I think it's overrated. Mm -hmm. um, it is weird to go to the north and when people ask for tea, They'll just get unsweet tea. That's yeah, very strange like, to me. Yeah. Down here, it's just it's just sweet tea. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I do not drink it. I make I make really good sweet tea, but oh, I don't drink it. That's a plus. That's a plus, though. At least you can yes. make it. You know? I put all the sugar in there. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's all it's about. It's about the sugar, you know. So you definitely yes. get high blood pressure if you want to drink it all the time. I was raised in Wilson, North Carolina, so I have like you know they do sweet tea out there in North Carolina. Yeah. Time, you know, so all right, great. Well, thank you, Mary Kay Spires. I appreciate you being on the podcast audience. Thank you for listening to Data is My Science podcast, the show that makes data your passion. I'm your host, Dapper Data. Where can they reach you at, Mary Kay Spires, if they need anything? So, pretty much, Mary Kay Spires anywhere, Mary Kay Spires.com with a C. Um, social, it's all very um, standard that just Google my name and you're there. Great. Great, great, great. And is there anything that you're promoting right now? You're doing a conference, book, anything like that that you want to Yeah, audience? yeah, actually. So I put out a book about a month ago. Um, it's called On the Map. It is specifically, it's for digital marketing for multi-location businesses, um, but it really is kind of a guidebook to getting started with digital marketing, no matter what industry you're in, or even if you just have one location. It's, it's a real simple how-to guide. 
Great, great, great. And audience, as you know, you can always reach me at Mr. Dapper Data on any one of the social media platforms. Um, thank you all for tuning in to another great episode of the Data is My Science podcast. And thank you, Mary Case Pirates, again. It's been a pleasure. I love you all, audience. Peace. Thank you.